So my name is Sebastian Guasgan uh, at Sebgoa on Twitter. And today I'm going to talk about serverless on Kubernetes with the software that we just uh, wrote a couple of months ago called Kubeless. And I'm very excited about it uh, because we're starting to be able to do really cool things with it and go beyond you know, containers and, uh, and actually Kubernetes itself, which is you know, very exciting. So the software is on uh, GitHub, Bitnami, Kubeless. Uh, so, you know, check it out, uh, definitely. So I used to, I, I founded a company called Skipbox. Uh, we actually sponsored the first KubeCon in the US and we did things like uh, Compose with a K that you find in the incubator, uh, things like KubeWatch, K-Machine, and, uh, and Cabin, the, uh, the iPhone Android app for, uh, for Kubernetes. But three weeks ago, we joined uh, Bitnami, uh, which is a company that does uh, app delivery, uh, application packaging for, uh, for the cloud. Uh, we also create uh, containers and so on. And you know, the, uh, the connection between the two companies you know, makes total sense to us because we can you know, help people go from bare metal, VM, cloud, containers, Helm charts, and then potentially serverless if it picks up. So you know, that's why it's, uh, it's quite exciting. So I want to I wanna spend a, you know, a little bit of time talking about serverless, the, the name, the, the buzz, and uh, I'm going to try to go relatively quickly through this, but I think it's very important to, to get the context. And then I want to do a demo, uh, live demo. So I have, I have a few demos, and we'll, we'll see how that goes there. You know, we still have a few bugs, so I may have to kick a few things to, to get things working, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. So you know, the, the, the first message, you know, why, why serverless on Kubernetes? And it's not because you know, I, I want the room to be, uh, to be full, because it's a, it's a buzzy word. And I could have added serverless, Kubernetes, machine learning, you know, something like this to, to make a big buzz. But you know, for, forget about the buzz. And, uh, and the, the, the message here, don't dismiss serverless. Uh, because it was very easy in 2006. You know, I was working on a big project in the US when, when Amazon announced EC2. And you know, uh, a friend of mine called me up and he said, hey, did you see Amazon just released EC2? And I was like, I'm not going to run uh, virtual machines on, on Amazon. That's, you know, that's crazy. Uh, so it was very easy to dismiss the, the beginning, of, beginning of the cloud. And now we, you know, we see how in 10 years you know, things, uh, things have changed and everything we can do in terms of IT, uh, IT in the cloud. So you know, let, let's not dismiss a new tech just because it's a, it's a buzzword and, and people are going a little bit crazy on the internet. Uh, marketing is, is going a little bit crazy and, and so on. And, and also, you know, I, I see a lot of discussion about serverless, you know, what does it mean and so on. And we, we see this all the time when there's a new tech, when there's a new word. Uh, you know, people are like, well, you know, it means this, it means that. Well, let's, let's not get hung up on the name, okay? And that's, that's from Twitter. Uh, you know, a couple of months ago at Serverless Austin, what is serverless? It's just somebody else fully managed execution environment, and I only pay a fraction of a cent when my function is run. Okay, so of course there is a server, there is a process running at the end of the day on a server, and the idea with serverless is that you're only paying you know a small fraction when the function is being called. So let, let's not get hung up on, let's not dismiss serverless because it's buzzy, and let's not get hung up on, on, on the name. And I'm not even going to mention uh, FAS, you know, function as a, as a service. And also, let's, let's not mind the fact that, you know, it's a, it's a hype, and we know this hype cycle, and then serverless is on the, on the trigger, so everybody is going a little bit crazy. But let's, you know, let's keep the, the hype. Let's, let's be open, because, you know, even when Docker started, it was very easy for us, you know, IT professionals with many years, you know, in the, in the industry to say, well, containers have existed for a long time, you know, we've had that in Solaris, we have LXC, you know, what is this Docker thing? So if you, if you do this, uh, you know, you're going to miss on a potential adoption curve, okay? And that's from Simon Wardley, uh, I totally stole that from him. And he said, that's the danger where, you know, in, in, uh, in red, you have the enterprise curve where the enterprise guy is saying, ah, no way, no way, I'm, you know, dismissing the new tech. And then, you know, he sees that the rest of the world is adopting it. And then he's like, I said, no, no, ah, oh, maybe, ah, oh, shit, you know, it's too late, okay? So the, the risk of dismissing all of this is just that, you know, this, this new tech is going to be adopted and then we're going to be left, left in the dust. 
Now, you know, for me, so I, I started looking at serverless because of some talks at KubeCon, you know, from Kelsey and from Brendan, who are trying to, we're talking about compiling to Cube, writing an application locally on your laptop, and then you, when you do run your executable, you know, it automatically distributes the, the various functions in, in Kubernetes. So I was interested by it. I thought that we could do a framework on top of Kubernetes, you know, quite, uh, at least get a proof of concept quite quickly. But basically, to me, you know, serverless, it's about knitting services together. So we're going to deploy services in our Kubernetes uh, clusters, maybe via Helm, so we're going to deploy an object store, maybe we're going to deploy a MongoDB, you know, you name it. We're gonna have all those services deployed in Kubernetes. And now you, you need to stitch them together and you need to, uh, to glue them together. So for me, it's just, you know, knitting and deploying those little logical, you know, units uh, in, uh, in your Kubernetes cluster. You know, the other, the other analogy is like gluing Legos. So Kubernetes, with Kubernetes, we can, we can deploy apps, microservices, and then, you know, we, we talk about all those Legos being assembled to, to maximize utilization in the cluster. So, you know, with, function, with uh, serverless or function as a service, you, you, you know, you choose your poison. You know, we're talking about finding a way to glue all those services together, okay? At least that's, you know, that's, that's my view of it. Now, of course, serverless, you know, Amazon Lambda is, is leading already there. They've made, a, they've made a big push. So, you know, in some sense, Google Cloud Function is already behind. You know, AWS is, you know, is, is quite far ahead there. Uh, but when you look at the examples that, you know, you, you can do with Lambda, you got relatively simple things like a thumbnail creation uh, pipeline. So you drop files in S3, automatically creates a thumbnail and puts it back in, a, in another bucket. Or you get data streams pipeline. You know, you listen to a stream on, on Kinesis, and then when there are events in that stream, you trigger functions, and then maybe you insert some, something in a, in a database. So you know, those are the types of uh, things that we can do with, uh, with Lambda, and you see that you have an S3 service, or you have a Kinesis service, a DynamoDB service, and the, the function deployment is about deploying this logical unit to stitch everything together and create a more interesting application. So what happens if you know, now we, we're deploying those services, we have Kubernetes to be able to do this, but now we want to deploy those functions to create much more interesting pipelines and complete applications. We need a way to be able to do this. If we don't have serverless, that means that you know, we need to write code and then go through, you know, we go through CI, we generate another container, we launch a new deployment, and you know, hopefully it, uh, everything gets, it gets connected. But with Lambda, we can do this you know, relatively easily. So it's basically you know, deploying functions, if this, then that type thing. Uh, there are lots of solutions out there already. So you got Lambda, Cloud Functions on Google, uh, Azure Functions, OpenWhisk, Function, you know, initiated from guys from JBoss, WebTask, Iron.io. So you got, you know, you got the already some, uh, some frameworks, some solutions, but none of them are truly Kubernetes native. And what I mean by that is, uh, you know, a, a function framework, function as a service framework that's going to reuse all the primitives from Kubernetes. So deployments, services, third-party resources, you know, a, you know, all those, all those great uh, building blocks that we have in the Kubernetes API. So with Kubeless, what we wanted to do is reuse all the base primitive in Kubernetes and allow us to, to build a framework so that we could deploy functions. Okay? Make sense? Good. Uh, you know, and I, I cannot do this talk without, you know, pointing to, to Simon Wardley again that he wrote a, a very interesting blog, Why the Fuss About Serverless? I'm not going to go deep into this because I want to concentrate on the demo and try to, you know, show, show it in, in action. But Simon writes uh, very interesting things about, you know, strategy in IT and then evolution of IT and how it affects the way we do things. So, you know, look it up on, uh, on Twitter and then find his blog, Why the Fuss About Serverless. It's, it's a very interesting read. And yes, I totally drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> I, like, I like what he says about serverless. It makes, you know, it makes, it makes total sense to me. Uh, the, way, the way Simon looks at this is that he builds map about uh, value in your company and then how the technology evolves. 
And he makes a point that you know, new, new concepts, new ideas in technology, they go from a uh, disruptive you know, concept and then they become a utility. And when so something becomes a utility, you know, especially like platform, infra, and so on, it changes the way we, uh, we develop and we write applications and we, the way we practice software and the way we do our business, okay? And if, if a practice changes, then it may move the, where you have value in your application or where you have value in your company. So you need to be very aware of this and very aware of you know, adoption of new tech and how it's going to impact you. So here we have, you know, we've had VMs, the cloud, now we have something with Kubernetes to deploy services, you know, containers. What if serverless really becomes uh, adopted in the industry? How is that going to impact the way that we manage infrastructure and the way that we develop applications? So that, you know, that's the real question to me. And, uh, and you know, Simon talks about the co-evolution. So a co-evolution of you know, the, basically the platforms, the infrastructure, and the practice of writing apps. So if, if functionless takes over, you know, I mean uh, serverless, not functionless, <laughs> serverless takes over, then it's going to change our practice of software, okay? And it, it talks about worth-based development, where now you have an application where all the logic is just a uh, you know, function. You can monitor all those functions so you know where the cost is and you also know where you're making money. So now you can start developing, trying to optimize for you know, lower cost and, and higher uh, value. So that's, that's a little bit fast there, but the, the takeaway is you know, check, out, check out what he's writing about IT strategy and, and you know, it, it informs a lot about why serverless may be uh, impacting the way we develop software, okay? And I, and I, tr I truly believe, uh, believe this. Uh, so now, serverless on Kubernetes and why, why kubeless? <coughs> so I mentioned last KubeCon, so there was, I mean, Craig McLucky from Eptio, he mentioned something about uh, serverless that he was looking forward to, to see a serverless framework on Kubernetes. Uh, there are existing frameworks, but you know, I believe that none of them are truly Kubernetes native. Uh, and then there was also this talk by, uh, by Brendan Burns who, it's on his GitHub, I mean, he's developed a system where you can basically some type of language bindings where you can write an app and say, hey, this is a service, you know, distribute it on Kubernetes and, and so on. So this talk reminded me a lot about uh, what I used to do, which is parallel computing. And there was a time in parallel computing where we had auto parallelizers. So I don't know if you guys remember some of those tools but you, you had serial code and then you would feed it to an auto parallelizer and then it would run it in parallel in a, a cluster, okay? So, you know, what if we were writing an app which would be, you know, almost a monolithic app and then we would automatically distribute it in a Kubernetes cluster? You know, I think that would be, a, that would be kind, of a, kind of interesting. But Kubernetes, you know, it's rewrite of Borg, Google Cloud Functions runs on Borg, so we should have a serverless framework on top of Kubernetes. <coughs> the number two is that, uh, so I've been, I've been using Kubernetes now for a, quite, a, quite some time, you know, maybe two years or something, uh, but granted not in production, okay? So I'll raise my hand, I don't run Kubernetes in production. But the thing, you know, even though I, I develop software for Kubernetes and I do, you know, a lot of testing, lots of, uh, you know, developing uh, new ideas and so on, the one thing that it's changing in my mind is that I don't care about the infrastructure, okay? I'm just talking to an API. I'm just talking to the Kube API. And I just want to use all the API primitives of Kubernetes, okay? And then the other thing that's happening uh, lately is that I actually don't care about the containers. I don't care about the runtime, you know, container D, rocket, whatever. I actually don't care about the runtime. And actually, you know, the, the actual containers that are running, I, I don't care much about the containers themselves, okay? What I'm interested in is deploying services and then building some interesting pipelines. So what this is bringing to me is that I'm actually going back to focusing on applications. So it's applications instead of infrastructure and, you know, I mean, networking and, you know, the, the, the actual system underneath. So it brings back the focus on, on applications. So that's, the, you know, that's, that's, what ha what that's what's happening and why, you know, Kubernetes makes a, a lot of sense for me to, to use as a, as a, uh, a platform to, deploy, to, to create a, a framework for, for serverless. So the, let's talk about the kubeless architecture before going into the, the demo. 
So uh, it's on GitHub, so you know, have a look at it. Uh, definitely, it's still rough, okay? I mean, it's definitely uh, usable. Uh, we use it every day now. But uh, it's still a little bit rough, so if you try it, you know, ping us on GitHub, file an issue, and then we'll, you know, we'll help you out uh, you know, actively. So I mentioned Kubernetes native. So at KubeCon, I was like, hey, you know, we should be able to do this you know, quite easily. We have third-party resources to extend Kubernetes. It's a great mechanism. Let's just create a third-party resource that defines a function. Now we're going to have a Kubernetes endpoint, which is functions. And we can start creating you know, functions in that custom endpoint. Okay? So Kubeless uses third-party resource. It gives us an endpoint with you know, REST, a REST endpoint for functions. But you know, it, the third-party resource in itself doesn't give you anything. Now you need to write a controller. So we have a Kubeless controller running in the cluster that watches this custom endpoint. And when there is a function being created or deployed, you know, then the controller does something. What does the controller do? The controller creates a deployment and a service on top of it. So it's all you know, Kubernetes uh, primitives. Now the actual function, how does the, the actual bit of code, how does the bit of code get inside the container? We actually stick the, the code in a config map. Okay? So you create the function with the third party resource, it gets, uh, a config map gets created, and that allows us to inject the function with a, a volume mount inside the container. Okay? We're not worrying yet about the, uh, the startup time. Okay? We're going to, uh, that's going to be a next phase to optimize the, the, the startup time to, uh, to, get, to get it going. Uh, we did a little bit of a hack. Okay? The, the big problem when you start going with uh, serverless is what about the dependencies of your function? The basic hello world, that's extremely easy. Okay? It's just, you know, there's no dependencies. But what, what happens when you have you know, loads of dependencies? So we did, a, you know, I have to confess, a little bit of a hack. So the deployment that uh, the controller creates uses an init container, and the init container just loads all the dependencies via, you know, in, a, in a volume that's shared with the actual runtime. A little bit of a hack, but it works great. Okay? Uh, now, you know, a lot of the, lot of the frameworks that, uh, that you did have, that, that you find out there, uh, they're mostly looking at HTTP triggers. So deploying functions that you can trigger with just an HTTP call. So it's pretty much like, you know, an easy way to deploy webhooks. What we wanted to do here is go straight at the uh, events mechanism. Because when you deploy all those services, what you want to do is deploy those logics that are, you know, triggered on events. So how can we manage events in a system like this? Well, when you install Kubeless, we also run Kafka, okay? So it's deployed in Kubernetes. You have the controller and you have Kafka. And now we can start feeding all our events in our system through uh, you know, various topics in our uh, you know, Kafka, Kafka broker, and the functions will be triggered on events. And it's all you know, bundled in, uh, you know, in, the, in the system. Why Kafka? Uh, why Kafka? Honestly, because I was you know, pushing Kubeless with uh, uh, an example with the S3, um, uh, in the Minio S3 object store, and it, you know, it, it uh, publishes events quite easily to, uh, to Kafka. We could, you know, we could use something else. If you guys are totally allergic to Kafka, we could, we could use a different type of, uh, of message bus. Now, you know, what happens when you do Kubeless install? It creates a third party resource. It, you know, by default, creates a Kubeless namespace. It launches the controller, and then it also launch, launches Kafka. So it, very much like Helm, you do Helm init. Here you do kubeless install, and you know, everything gets, uh, gets created. Now you end up with a, a, a third-party resource for functions, and then you have the CLI, the kubeless CLI. So the, the, main, uh, the main function is kubeless deploy that allows you to, uh, to create functions. The CLI is currently totally compliant with the Google Cloud Function CLI. So it's a, if you use Google Cloud Function, you know, Kubeless gives you exactly the same type of interaction. The API is not compatible because the API is, is a, you know, just a, a REST endpoint of the third party resource, but the CLI is actually uh, compatible with Google Cloud Function. So you deploy the function. Uh, if it's just an HTTP trigger, it gets injected into a pod, and there is an HTTP wrapper so that you can make HTTP calls. 
for events, uh, we have a little bit of, we have a, a convenience wrapper with Kubeless where you can talk to Kafka and you can create topics automatically. So you can do Kubeless topic create, so you can manage, you know, manage your topics. And then, you know, same idea, you deploy a function, but you say that it's, uh, it's triggered on a particular topic and, and then, you know, it, it, gets, it gets deployed. So, time for demo. Oh, okay, it should be function deploy. We changed that. So, starting a function going to look like this. Kubeless function deploy. Name of the function here, it was get. Uh, I didn't put, you know, I just put the, the flag. So, you, uh, here you specify that it's, uh, it's triggered by HTTP, trigger HTTP. If it's uh, supposed to be triggered by events, it's going to be triggered topic. Runtime, we support Python, Node.js, uh, and soon uh, Ruby. Uh, from file, that's where you have your code. And dependencies, you know, for Python, it's like a requirements file, or if, uh, if it's Node, it's going to be a package.json. OK? So, demo. Is that big enough in the back? Yeah? Okay, so if I first look at, you know, all my pods in my, uh, in my cluster, uh, you'll see that I have a kubeless namespace, and in it I have the controller that's running, plus Kafka. This is definitely not a production deployment for Kafka. You know, it's a single pod, and then, you know, you have one controller for Zookeeper, one controller for Kafka. I mean, you know, we would, for production, we would need to, you know, come up with a, a proper Kafka, Kafka deployment. Uh, but now you have, you know, if you look at the third party resource, you see that we have a third party resource, which is function.kls.io, which means that now we could potentially, I mean, we can do get functions, you know, and, uh, and you get it. Okay, so we have a, a function endpoint in our, in our cluster. So now you have the kubeless CLI. Uh, so you can do, you know, function ls, so right now I have no functions. And then if you want to manage topics, you, you can do topic ls, talks to Kafka, maybe. There you go. It, uh, that's a pretty, uh, you know, very basic wrapper here. So I have one, one topic here that's uh, s3, okay? So I'm just going to do a, a first example, which is a HTTP trigger uh, example. I'm going to deploy a function that sends a tweet. Okay, it's kind of funny, but I mean, I think it's totally useless, but it's, it's, it's funny. Uh, and the example here is in, uh, in Python. I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit because this, this looks long. The actual function is this three lines at the end. Okay, so it gets the payload that will come from the HTTP call and then, you know, API, post, and I'm just sending the tweet, okay? Now, what's, what's at the top? You see that there is the, a dependency on a, on a Twitter client. And then I'm also using the, the Python client for Kubernetes. Okay, check it out in the incubator. You know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite good. The reason I'm using this is because I wanted to be able to load secrets. Because if I want to talk to the Twitter API, I need the keys to my, uh, my Twitter API. So I actually stored all the Twitter stuff, uh, the keys, into a Kubernetes secret. And then with this bit of you know, dirty Python, I can actually talk to Kubernetes API and retrieve the secret directly in my function. You know, I think that's, uh, that's, quite, uh, you know, that's quite handy. So if I look at get secrets, I have a few secrets there. I have secrets for Minio, I have secrets for Slack, that's my Slack token, and secrets for, for Twitter, okay? So now let's, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit here and, and look at, yeah, just copy paste this. So that's the actual deployment of the function. Function deploy, a name, trigger, runtime Python, handler, which is the, uh, the name of the file, and then the name of the function. It's just like Google Cloud function. And then the, the requirements. So let's copy this. And now what, what happens is that hopefully it worked. So we have function, now we have a function, which is type HTTP. And now if I look at my pods, hopefully, yeah, thank you. I have a, a pod that was just created by my controller. 
you see that currently it's running the init container because I need to be able to install the Twitter API. And then once that, that runs, <coughs> I'll be able to I'll be able to uh, to curl my function. So I'm just gonna I'm just going to just do this, which is my curl, and in another window, I'm going to, well, OK, I have, I have the proxy running. Uh, I can do it on GKE, but I thought it was a very bad idea because then you know, the func I can expose the function with an ingress, and everybody could you know, curl that and then tweet on my account. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was not, uh, it, was, it was kind of funny, but uh, here you go. So, now the dep so that's a bit slow because it needs to install the dependency, OK? Now, of course, if we want to update the function, we can do this just by editing the config map. That's kind of handy. We edit the config map. Sorry? Can you add a new function in the Can I add another function? Yes. Yeah, so you could edit, you could edit the, uh, the config map and, uh, and add a function, uh, but they would need, it would need to be called by the first one. Uh, but then there is a, a problem in Kubernetes that when you update a config map, you know, the, the, the pods that mount that config map don't get redeployed. So we need to, we need to, to work on that. So let's, let's tweet this. Well, okay, I'm just gonna tweet this to, uh, to save time here. Let's tweet this. So I'm curling my, uh, my function and where's my, oh, here. If I go to my Twitter, did I tweet this? I did? Yeah, 15 seconds ago. This rocks from Kubeless. Great. No? <laughs> so that, that's the basic, that's the basic uh, uh, HTTP trigger function, okay? Deployed on the fly. And of course, sending tweet is not you know, really easy, but you can imagine building lots of web hooks. And I was talking to someone who was like, yeah, what I want to do is just be able to trigger a rolling update by calling a function. And that would be super easy to write a little function in Python that actually uh, updates a deployment. And then you have your CI pipeline calling that function and then you know, triggering the rolling updates automatically. So that's great. So now let's do something uh, a little bit more interesting. Uh, so what I've done here is that you, know, you mentioned, I mentioned stitching services together. So what I've, what I've done before is that I've deployed Minio, the S3 clone, the object store. I've deployed it with Helm, okay? So Helm release, I have Minio running. And I have Minio running somewhere. I have Minio running here. So that's the web interface to, to Minio. It's been configured so that when, <coughs> so when something happens on a, on a bucket, uh, it, it sends an event to, to Kafka. So I'm going to create a bucket called uh, foobar. Yeah, I'm going to create a bucket called foobar, and I'm going to deploy a function that you know, watches files being put in that bucket, and every time there's a new file there, it's going to send me a message on Slack. Sounds, sounds good? So I go to my Slack example, and this is on the, all of this is on the, the GitHub uh, repo. So the, the function you know, is, same idea, you got like this, this secret loading uh, in Python. You have access to the Minio uh, service, okay? With the, you know, it's, Minio is exposed by a service, so this is, you know, standard. And then you see the function here at the bottom, which is just saying, okay, if I receive the put event on Minio, you know, extract the bucket name, the file name, and then send a message to Slack, okay? So I'm just going to send this. Uh, I'm going to do this. So kubeless function, I can delete functions with the, the CLI, rename it, and uh, you know, so on. So the function is there. Did it create a pod? Yes. And again, you see that the pod is being, is being created. It's a different runtime, because now that runtime, by default, as a Kafka consumer, OK? So the, the, the function is basically injected by a config map and, and we get it dynamically with like uh, loading the module and, and, and so on. Maybe, maybe Rene, you want to improve my Python because it's, it's pretty bad. So we just need, we just, we need to, to wait 
you know, a little bit so that it, uh, it installs the, the Slack client. So we've discussed internally a new, a new architecture to make this you know, a little bit faster so that we can create a, you know, an image for the runtime with the, the dependencies loaded so that when we, when we start function and when we scale them, you know, they're gonna start uh, really quickly. Right now you could scale, but every time you, every part in, the, in your scaling would need to run the init container. So that's, you know, that's not super optimal, but we, we, have, we have a solution for, uh, for this. Uh, also, one thing I, I'm not I'm not going to have time to demo it, but the HTTP runtime is currently instrumented with Prometheus, so we actually serve Prometheus metrics for the runtime. So you go to Prometheus, you see the fun you can monitor the function calls. Okay, so we're going to put also the uh, the uh, Prometheus uh, monitoring into the event uh, system, so it it will be uh, it will be fully. Uh, fully monitored, and then the idea is that with Prometheus, we can use custom metrics for the horizontal pod autoscaler, and now we have our functions scaling, you know, if, if there are lots of calls. So let's see if this works. So this is my object store. I'm going to drop a file in there. Me, okay, whatever, I could, and then that should send me a Slack message. And I think what's happening is that when, I, when I'm in view like this, uh, when I'm in view, somehow I don't get the notification. So let's. Ah, you're the man. Bucket name is wrong. Fubar. Okay, Fubar. Let's try again. A different. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's a little you know little alerting mechanism here. Thank you for catching that. That's uh, that's handy. Okay, now I want to do something a little bit more interesting. Okay, which is the thumbnail creator. Uh, this is out of the box, out of uh, fresh, you know, from uh, from yesterday. So we're gonna see if this works. Uh, let's do so. It's resize. It's one of the example for AWS Lambda. So. Let's look at the resize, and it, it's Python because you know I mostly know Python. I'm, I'm actually more of a sysadmin than a developer, so you know this is bad. But please, you know, help me improve it. <laughs> uh, it's using a Python module which is uh, Pillow, and here you see the the image thumbnail creation. Uh, it's very dirty. I'm, I'm listening to Mino. I'm creating a temporary file inside the container, fetching the file that's this fget object creating the thumbnail, and then putting the thumbnail into a different folder. That, does that make sense? So I'm going to go to my, I'm going to go to my menu, and what I need to do is create another bucket called thumb. <coughs> and I need to start, I need to create the function. So where's my function? Here, so function, okay. Uh, I'm going to change its name because I, sometimes it's a little bit, uh, we, have, we have a tiny bug in there. Okay, so I've created uh, a new function, function ls. Let's try to watch the pods. Okay, it's creating. So we have to wait a little bit that it gets created. We'll put Minio here. I'm going to kill that, kill that, kill that. Keep the Slack open. So now notice that I still have the other functions running. And those of you who know Kafka a little bit is that each function gets in a different consumer group. So I'm going to deploy this new function. It's going to be called, but the Slack one is also going to be called. Okay, so messages get into different consumer group. So we just need to. Yeah, it's the, the dependency handling. If uh, once we once we figure out the uh, a build system to actually preload the dependencies and then use those images, 
you know, the, this uh, cold startup time will get much faster. Say that again? Yeah. No, so the, the, the images are already there, but what's what's happening is that you know it's uh, it's 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 trying to do a pip install of the, the pillow inside the, that init container. And right now we're not uh, we're not reusing the 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 end the, the, the image that's built at the end. But yeah, that can be improved. Okay, I'm gonna I'm just gonna finish the slides and then just before I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it. So the, the roadmap here is that we have to improve our run times. I mean, it, right now it's, uh, you know, it's still very rough, uh, so we need, to, we need to improve things you know, in the runtime. Better dependency management, that's what I, I, I'm mentioning with this, uh, this init container. Currently it works well, but it needs to be, uh, to be improved. We also need authorizations for, authorization for functions. That's definitely is something like feedback that we've had from, from several folks because otherwise anybody can call your functions. So we're experimenting with things like Auth0 to be able to add, to have Auth0 authorization directly in the runtimes. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, we could automatically create ingress resources, which would give us some type of API gateway, uh, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense all the time. So it, it, may be, it may be a flag, an additional flag here to, to create the ingress. Uh, instrument the runtime for events uh, so that we have the, the proper Prometheus monitoring, which gives us the auto scaling. I mentioned that. And then look at a lot of services that we can deploy with Helm, for example. And Bitnami has been you know, doing lots of uh, work on the, the charts. So that's where we're going to look at all those charts and figure out the ones that we can easily uh, you know, either. Uh, uh, repackage or, or use that are going to emit events. Okay, we need services that emit events. And Kafka is great for this because there are lots of Kafka plugins that can uh, help us, you know, like for example, you have MySQL and then every time you do an insert in the database, sends a message which would trigger a, a function. Uh, so that, yeah, that's the, the services by Helm. And definitely the service broker is going to be interesting in all of this because with the service broker running, now we can potentially bring in services from public clouds. So we're going to have on-prem services deployed as you know, Helm charts, and then we can bring in external via the service catalog and have those lo that logical glue with uh, you know, kubeless. So that's, that's, you know, that's the, uh, the main idea right now. So let's see if you know, I got lucky and, uh, ah, no, I shouldn't have pushed. It didn't like my, uh, okay, well, too bad. So you have to believe me that the, the thumbnail creation uh, works. You know, I'm not going to try to, uh, to debug this. Uh, but you know, please give, you know, give Kubeless a try. You know, give, us, uh, give us some feedback, let's say, you know, and, and let's see if you know, we, can, we can push this further and, uh, and make it you know, even uh, more interesting. So don't dismiss serverless just because it's buzzy. Uh, you know, Kubeless is Kubernetes native. I think that's the real strength of the system. We're not writing our own API server, you know, routers, things like this. We're just reusing everything, starting with third-party resources to extend Kubernetes. Uh, and it looks just like Google Cloud Functions. We have lots of ideas to be able to, to take existing Lambda functions and make them run in, in Kubeless. So we'll, we'll see how that, how that goes. But yeah, definitely, you know, give it a try and uh, give us some feedback. That, you know, that would be terrific. Thank you.